Um, let's have a, let's have a, the last speaker for um, SANE 2018 is uh, going to be Justin Salomon. Uh, and uh, so Justin uh, moved a lot. He uh, did his bachelor at the University of Cambridge in the UK, uh, the old Cambridge. And uh, uh, then he moved on to do his uh, master's and PhD at University of Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. D uh, during his PhD, he did a stint at IRCAM in Paris, uh, and then moved to NYU as a postdoc and is now a senior researcher in MARL, not MERL, the <laughs> Music and Audio Research Lab. Uh, and he's done a lot of work on bioacoustics and uh, music information retrieval and uh, um, environmental sound. And he's going to talk to us about. Um, uh, all the above, the, mostly the uh, environmental sound, I guess. The, so the title of the talk, if you get it right, uh, Robust Sound Event Detection in Acoustic Sensor Networks. Thanks. All right, thanks. This is not, OK. Hi, everyone. Uh, I realize I'm the last thing standing between you and a refreshing drink, so thanks for hanging in there. Uh, and staying with me. Yeah, so I'm here to talk about robust sound event detection in acoustic sensor networks. Um, and this is kind of a lot of work by a lot of people centered around our music and audio research lab, but also people in uh, affiliated with our research projects, Sonic and BirdVox. So um, this is most of the people currently at the music and audio research lab. We love SANE, so uh, a lot of us are here today. We had some posters as well, so hopefully you got a chance uh, to interact with different members of the lab. And uh, we have these two uh, large projects we've been working on in the last couple of years um, that both are trying to leverage acoustic sensor networks. So the first one is Sonic, or Sounds of New York City, and the idea is to try and battle noise pollution by basically having this data-driven approach and building a noise map of the city, not just how loud it is, but also what are the sources of noise, which is why we need sound recognition, using these uh, steampunk-looking sensors that we have deployed uh, across the New York City. The second project, um, kind of pretty different, this is under the BirdVox project, and here the idea is to track migration patterns of birds uh, using these remote acoustic sensors. So two projects, pretty different goals, but they actually, it turns out, they share some common challenges, and so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so just uh, Sonic, a lot of us, uh, uh, in red, the ones of us who are here today. Uh, this is the BirdVox team, so a few of us here today as well. So before I jump right in, why should we even care about noise in the first place, right? So turns out that at least New Yorkers care about noise a lot. It's becoming, you know, it's a very noisy city, uh, the city that, you know, never sleeps, or rather the city that doesn't let you sleep. And um, the, you know, noise is becoming an increasingly larger and larger problem such that city agencies, in particular the Department of, Envi of Environmental Protection, uh, who's in charge of kind of battling noise, this is now one of their top priorities. And you know, it's been estimated that nine out of 10 adults in the city are exposed to harmful levels of noise. The number of complaints on the city's 311 service is growing from year to year. Um, and though some of us might think of noise as just a nuisance, it actually can have a lot of very negative uh, effects, economic, but also more importantly, uh, health-related effects. Um, and it also made me move out of my apartment about a couple of years ago, so I'm kind of personally attached to this issue. So, um, in order to tackle noise, you know, before we throw technology at the problem, we need to understand how, what, how, what's the city doing right now in order to tackle noise pollution. Um, so let's say that there's noise somewhere and somebody calls and complains. The city will send the noise abatement commission. They will drive up to Times Square. They'll ask everybody to be very, very quiet, and they'll take a few measurements. A um, hundred years ago, in fact. Uh, nowadays, fast forward into the present. Uh, basically, let's say that there is a certain noise source. Um, you will call and complain to the city's 311 service, and a few hours later, they will dispatch an inspector. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you're lucky, it's in a few hours. If you're not, it's a few days. The city has about 50 for a city of 8 million, 50 inspectors for 8 million people. So clearly, they have a big resource allocation problem, right? Most of the time, by the time they actually get to the place, the offending noise is no longer there. <laughs> 
So the idea is, uh, of the Sonic project is to try and alleviate this problem using acoustic sensors. So you can think of the project as a cyber-physical system, as a closed loop with three primary components. We have sensing, which involves, first of all, citizens, right, who call and report, but then we're deploying these acoustic sensors to measure how loud it is and automatically recognize different sources of noise. Um, that information kind of flows into an analytics pipeline, and that allows us to inform city agencies like the DEP, both in real time in terms of what noise is happening, but also collect information over time and space to identify patterns such that we really help them kind of optimize where they dispatch their inspectors to maximize the probability of them actually being there when the noise is occurring. And so we can provide this information to city agencies, and that allows them to impact the physical world again. Um, and in addition, of course, to the immediate goals of the project, we want to, you know, this uh, would enable a lot of interesting research between noise and different factors in the city, like crime and education, and also empower poor citizens such as myself to make better decisions about where they're going to live. Um, so here again is one of our, our sonic sensors, and the oldest of these have been uh, up for a little over two years now, including enduring the tough New York City winter, um, and so far they've been doing uh, pretty well. And in Sonic, we're trying to identify these kinds of sources, right? So things that generate noise, sounds that we would generally consider uh, unpleasant. In the BirdVox project, on the other hand, we're trying to identify a whole different type of sources of sound, such as these little fluffy guys. Um, and so why would we care about identifying, uh, you know, bird vocalizations? Well, this is a collaboration with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and for them it's really valuable to build models like this, right? So for a given species, a model of how the species migrates, so this is over time and space. And if you are able to build a model like this, it allows you to derive new biological insights and also um, conservation-related applications. The problem is that at the moment, they have two primary sources of information in order to build these models. The first one is citizen science, and so basically bird watchers, they'll go out, they'll observe birds, they'll upload their observations online. The second uh, source of information is weather radar data, uh, and this, when there are large flocks of birds that migrate, that kind of lights up uh, in this information. The problem is that uh, with citizen science, you know, people go out during the day, whereas a lot of the species we care about migrate at night. Um, when it comes to radar data, you can identify a flock, but it doesn't contain any species-specific information. So the idea is to introduce audio as this third component. We can have our sensors on 24-7, or at least in particular at night, when we expect these species to migrate. And we can, from the vocalizations of these birds, trace back which species were migrating, and so this gives us the, um, these two missing bits of information. So, a couple of years ago, Juan, uh, the director of our lab, was here uh, talking about Sonic, and so I wanted to kind of start where Juan left off. Um, basically, at the time, we had a ConvNet uh, combined with some data aug audio data augmentation using the Muda library, um, and that kind of allowed us to get state-of-the-art results on this Urban Sound uh, 8K dataset, which we'd uh, collected by crawling sounds from the web because we didn't really have some sensor data yet, and I think we finished off by showing this demo of a continent running in real time, and we can see it here basically uh, responding to different sounds as they're presented to the network. Um, and I think this uses like a three second context window, so it takes a little bit to kind of latch onto different sets. All right, great. Two years later, 2018, we've collected uh, over 6,000 hours of audio via the BirdVox network. We've collected over 26 years of audio via the sonic sensors. And so, you know, new data presents new and uh, interesting challenges. Um, how do we label? the data? How do we leverage kind of the labeled data that we have to the best of our ability? How can we leverage the unlabeled data or generally unlabeled data? And finally, um, you know, uh, in machine learning always generalization is an issue, but here we really have this strong generalization challenge where our sensors might be in one location and we want to deploy a new sensor in a totally different location, never seen before, and we still need our sound recognition models to generalize to these previously unseen locations and environments. So these are kind of the four questions that I'm going to center my talk today around. Um, 
So the first one, how do we label the data? I'm going to be talking about results from uh, three papers and a lot of people involved in putting this together. Um, and so generally, first of all, before how do we label the data, what do we want to label the data for? Our goal is generally sound event detection. So the idea is that audio comes in, goes into your sound event detection model, and it spits out labels that include the start time, end time, and class, or label, if you will, of the sounds that we care about. So this is our goal. And typically, we train these with uh, what's called strong labels. So basically, labels that contain the start time, end time, and class of every sound. Um, and so we said, OK, how can we go about collecting these? And as um, several speakers have mentioned before, you know, let's turn to crowdsourcing. The problem is, we don't really have a lot of experience with crowdsourcing audio data. How should we, you know, how do we know that the labels we get back are high quality? How do we know what interface des choice, desi like design choices, how do those influence the quality of the labels that we get back? So before we kind of jumped straight into collecting data, we decided to run some experiments. So uh, we built this web-based uh, interface called the Audio Annotator. It's open source. You can use it for your own crowdsourcing experiments. And for example, the first very simple question is, how should we visualize the audio? We could use a spectrogram. We could use a waveform. We could use no visualization at all. And we were running this experiment on Mechanical Turk. So this is people who have most of them most likely have never seen a spectrogram before in their lives. In addition, we wanted to understand how the complexity of the sound scene affects the quality of the annotations, right? So the degree of overlap of sounds, the signal to noise ratio of the sounds with respect to the background, how do all of these factors affect quality of labels? Now, of course, if we want to study how these factors affect human labelers, we can't label the data ourselves and compare humans to humans. So how do we generate audio stimuli that have perfect annotations such that we know we, that we can compare kind of the human labelers to this data? Well, we need to somehow synthesize or generate this data uh, programmatically. And so we went and wrote Scaper, which is an open source Python library that allows you to basically sequence different sounds. And you can choose a distribution over SNR. You can throw in some automated data augmentation. And it will just uh, automatically generate as many soundscapes as you want from your source material. Think It's like an automated sequencer, including both the audio and the annotations. So now we have audio files with perfect annotations. We know they correspond to each other exactly, and we can evaluate human labelers. Um, and this was the original motivation of Scaver, but since then we've actually we kind of realized we can also use this to train and evaluate machine listening models. Um, and soon, with the help of Prame, this will also be useful for generating data for source separation experiments. So hopefully, um, uh, some of you will find Scaper useful. So uh, jumping, I'll just jump straight into kind of the results of these experiments and the key findings. Um, first of all, using spectrograms as a visualization kind of works best, and it results in both higher quality annotations, but also faster annotations. So even if your annotators never saw a spectrogram in their life, using spectrograms uh, helps them. Um, and in fact, here what we see is the, perf the average performance of the labelers as a function of how many soundscapes they've already annotated, going from 1 to 10. And we see that there's a learning effect, in particular with the spectrogram. So the more they annotate, the better they get at it. And so if you are going to collect data via crowdsourcing, you want to make sure you give your labelers or your, your, um, your annotators some training because you're going to get better uh, quality labels. Um, and finally, looking at kind of soundscape complexity and SNR of the events, um, as you might expect, the more overlap of sounds there are and the weaker the sounds they are, the more the recall goes down, so people start missing sounds. But interestingly, it doesn't affect precision. So you know the labels you're getting back are precise, but expect some of the sounds just to be missing from your annotation. And finally, how many annotators do you need for every file, right? You can't trust the annotation of just one person. So we took uh, you know, multiple annotations for the same file, we aggregated them, and then we evaluated how well uh, the aggregation performs compared to kind of aggregating all the annotators. And we see that once we hit kind of 16 annotators, you've got most of the gain, but 16 is a lot, but it looks like you need at least five to have a reliable annotation. So, okay, this was uh, really helpful, but throughout these experiments, I think kind of one resonating lesson we learned is that annotating strong labels takes a very long time. And so, at this point, we said, okay, how can we get around this? 
And this brings me to the second question of today's talk, which is how can we best leverage the data, or rather now that we know about strong labels, can we get away without them? Because labeling the start time and end time of every individual sound is very time consuming. So uh, this paper was published very recently. And so again, our initial idea is sound event detection in audio out labels with start time, end time, and class. And as I mentioned, typically we'll train these with strong labels, but in contrast to strong labels, we have weak labels. And weak labels uh, are often referred to as tags. These are the labels provided, for example, with the audio set data set. And the idea is that they just indicate the presence or absence of the sound, but they don't tell you where in the recording that happens. They just say, somewhere in here, there's a siren, but I'm not gonna tell you where. So these labels don't contain as much information, but of course they are much faster and easier and depending on your process, cheaper to collect. So if we can train a model to do sound event detection using weak labels instead of strong labels, that's a big win for us. We can label our data a lot more effectively. We can leverage existing data sets like AudioSet. So our problem is basically we're given a bunch of tracks with these tags or weak labels, and we want to use this as training data to train a model that can nonetheless, given a new audio track, output strong labels, i.e. pinpoint the location of these sound events in time. So how do we do that? Before I explain that, I'll explain quickly how we do it if we did have strong labels. So we start with a, a representation of our audio signal, such as a log mail spectrogram. We'd slice it up into frames. We'd pass these frames into our model. The model would output a likelihood of the different sound classes being present in each frame. And then because we have these strong labels, we can just individually compare every the output for every frame against the labels, compute our loss, and update the parameters of the model accordingly. The problem is now we don't have strong labels. We just have weak labels, so we just have these two tags. They don't tell us anything about where the sounds occur. And so the question is, how do we compare these to the output of the model such that the model still learns to pinpoint the location of these sound events in time? So. Um, our idea is to frame this as a multiple instance learning problem. If you're familiar with multiple instance learning, great. If you're not, don't worry about it because I'll just mention the relevant uh, bits of information in order to follow. So again, we start with our time frequency uh, representation. Under MIL, this would be referred to as a bag. Uh, and during training, we have our two uh, kind of uh, labels. These are the bag level labels. We split our track again into frames. Under MIL, these would be called instances. Uh, and this time, because we don't have labels for each instance, we would feed all of them into the model together jointly. The model would somehow output um, you know, uh, a likelihood for every frame or instance. But now, we need to somehow aggregate or combine these into a single label or single uh, likelihood for the entire track or for the entire bag. Um, of a sound being present, like what's the likelihood of clapping being present anywhere in this track? Because once we have that, we can compare it against our training labels, um, minimize loss, for example, by stochastic gradient descent, update the parameters of the model. So the challenge becomes, what layer do we put here, this temporal pooling or aggregation, such that we can effectively train the model to pinpoint the location of these sound events? So the challenge becomes, what do we use here? So just to kind of uh, further illustrate this, let's say I have six frames. My model gives me an output likelihood for each one. Um, it's basically a time series of likelihoods. I will now want to pass these through some sort of aggregation function that will give me the likelihood of the sound being present anywhere in the track, okay? And so initially, perhaps, you know, the, sim the simplest in inclination would be, well, let's use a max function, right? Let's basically take our most confident prediction from any given frame and propagate that to be the likelihood of the sound present somewhere in the bag. So use max as a pooling function. The problem is, and as we'll soon see, this is basically all a neural network, and so this would be a max pooling layer as part of a neural network, um, which is that when we update the parameters via back propagation, we kind of, the gradient only will only flow to those parameters that contributed to generating the likelihood of the instance that ended up being the max. And so training with max pooling under this scenario 
uh, means that gradient is not flowing through the entire model. It's slow to train. It's sensitive to initialization. So we really want some form of aggregation function that does take some form of weighted average or does combine all of the individual per frame likelihoods because then gradient will flow through the entire model. Um, and the simplest approach we could think of is just averaging, right? Taking mean pooling. The, and mean pooling indeed uh, behaves well during training. The problem is it doesn't actually do what we want, right? Imagine that we have a few frames with high confidence and the rest of the track is low. If we just take a simple average, we're gonna end up with a low value and we're gonna get the wrong number. So we need something that trains like a mean function but behaves like a max function. And the logical next step is a soft max, right? So basically, uh, here on the left, we have the uh, formula for using soft max as an aggregation. So we're using soft max to compute the weights for a weighted average. To quickly illustrate this, let's say we have a few input probabilities. We pass those through soft max, so now they're all positive, they all sum to one. We use these as weights against the initial series of inputs. Um, and that's how we compute our weighted average. And the nice thing about this is that it's a weighted average, so the gradient flows through the whole model, but it behaves more like a max in that high inputs get high weights. So we were happy, you know, we felt this is a step in the right direction, uh, but we have a problem. Because our inputs are already these probabilities and they're bounded between zero and one, and softmax uh, kind of constrains the sum of all of its output weights to also sum to one, it means that the weights that softmax pooling can generate are bounded. And in particular, it depends on the size of your bag, or in our case, the length of our audio track. The more frames we have in our audio track, the more the weights that softmax can generate are kind of converged towards uniform weights. And so it converges to a simple mean pooling, and we lose this max-like behavior that we needed. So how do we get around this bounding issue? We introduce a new layer called auto pool, and it's a very simple extension on top of softmax pooling. Basically, the idea is to remove the bounding issue by introducing a parameter alpha. And we just multiply all of our input likelihoods by alpha prior to computing the softmax weights. And so now the, the weights that softmax pooling can generate are no longer bounded. Um, and basically, the, the important takeaway from here is that when alpha is zero, this simplifies to mean pooling. When alpha is one, uh, this goes back to being softmax pooling, and when alpha tends to infinity, this acts more and more like a pure max function. So now we have a single pooling function that can smoothly and continuously interpolate between mean, softmax, and max pooling-like behavior. And in the multi-label case, we actually learn a separate alpha value for every class. So now the model can actually adapt to the temporal characteristics of the different sound classes independently choosing the most appropriate value of alpha depending on the temporal characteristics of the sound class. For our experiments, in addition to just our kind of uh, pure auto pool, we also introduced two uh, variants of auto pool, so constrained auto pool, cap, or regularized auto pool, wrap. Uh, we didn't try constrained regularized auto pool because the acronym wouldn't really work on a slide. Um, to evaluate this, we, um, our goal is to evaluate the different pooling functions. And so the idea is what, you know, replace the layer that goes where this pink rectangle is. So the rest of the model we want to keep fixed, the architecture. We use a fairly straightforward, uh, fully convolutional architecture, and that gives us our per frame output, and then those go into the pooling function. What we do vary are the pooling functions, or the pooling layers, if you will. Um, we evaluate you know, the fixed pooling, less such as max, mean, and soft max, and different variants of our adaptive pooling layer auto pool. Now, in addition to comparing these different models, which are all trained against the weak labels, we also compare them to a model that's directly trained against strong labels. And that kind of represents our best case scenario. So ideally, we want the pooling-based models to approach the performance of the model trained against the strong labels, because that would tell us that we can use weak labels to train a model that does as well as if we did have strong labels, and that's kind of our goal. Um, we evaluate it using a, a bunch of different evaluation metrics. For today, I'll just focus on, on F1. 
Um, we use three different data sets to evaluate this with fairly different characteristics. Uh, I won't dive into too much detail. Uh, the first one is Urban Set, which is 10,000 soundscapes which we synthesized using Scaper. So the source material is Urban Sound 8K and we use that to synthesize uh, 10,000 soundscapes. The second one comes from the DK2017 challenge. It's a small subset of audio set, roughly 50,000 samples. And the third one is MedleyDB where we apply some uh, a bit of uh, remixing to make the data set a little larger. So this is um, uh, a music data set. And so in going into the results, I won't show all the results for all the different data sets. I just want to highlight a few quick points uh, in the paper. We kind of slice and dice it every which way. Um, looking at the results for urban said, uh, at the top we have the fixed pooling operators. Uh, below that we have the different variants of auto pool. And at the bottom we have the performance of the model trained directly against the strong labels. And kind of really the most important take home message is that uh, the variants of the auto pool layer consistently outperform the fixed pooling operators and approach the performance of the model trained against the strong labels. And this is the big win for us. It means we can use weak labels and we get a model that performs practically as well as a model trained against strong labels. And the reason that the fixed pooling operators don't really perform as well is because when we looked at the per class performance, we saw that for different sound classes, a different fixed pooling operator worked better. Sometimes it was mean, sometimes it was max. Sometimes it's a softmax, but by using auto pool, it can basically figure out the best value for each class depending on its characteristics. The second thing I wanted to show are the learned values of alpha. So here on the left, we have kind of the average duration of these different sound classes in the DCase data set uh, with respect to the full duration of the soundscape, which is 10 seconds in this data set because this comes from audio set. On the right, we have the alpha values learned for different, mod different variants of auto pool. Uh, and just to keep things simple, focus on the blue horizontal bars, which is just the pure auto pool function. We see that for sounds that tend to be relatively short compared to the duration of the soundscape, it learns high values of alpha. And that makes sense, because if the sound kind of only happens for a short amount, you want max pooling in order to be able to propagate that label. However, if the sound ha and so high levels of, al of alpha correspond to max-like behavior. On the other hand, if you have a sound that's pretty much stable and stationary throughout most of your soundscape, like a truck sound, uh, truck engine sound, then maybe you want to use mean pooling because you're basically collecting more and more evidence that the sound is indeed present in the soundscape. And indeed what we observe is that the model learns much smaller values of alpha. So this is just kind of a sanity check showing us that the model is behaving as we would expect. And then finally for MedleyDB, just again to highlight that um, the best variant of auto pool again approaches very closely the performance of the strong model. So for us, this is kind of a win. It basically means we can use weak labels. We don't need to label the start time, end time of every sound. We can just label presence or absence for each track. And using this paradigm, we can still train a model to pinpoint the location of sound events in time. Uh, just a quick example. So here's, let's say, the input representation for one of our test samples. Um, this is what a perfect output would look like. So time moving from left to right, black indicating the sounds are present. So we start with an engine, and then we have a siren and some drilling coming in, and then the siren lasts throughout to the end. So let's quickly listen to that. Maybe we'll do that again. All right, and the output of the model for one of the uh, regularized auto pool variants is like this. So of course it's not 100% perfect. There's some confusions between similar sound classes such as engines and AC units, but generally we see the model does a good job both at identifying which sounds are present and when they start and when they end. And this was a model that was trained using only weak labels that just said that the sound is somewhere in here, yes or no. All right, so we have an efficient way of, lev le le of leveraging <laughs> our weak labels, but what do we do with all the rest of the data which is unlabeled? And this is you know, both our data or just generally um, if we have you know, access to a large data set that doesn't have the labels that we want for our target class, how can we leverage that? And so this uh, is work done with uh, Jason and Hoshang and Juan and hopefully will come out soon. Um, so as you might imagine, as we've seen throughout the day, audio embeddings for the win, 
Um, and so this is just for us was a kind of an initial exploration, right? So for those of you who might not be familiar with audio embeddings, basically the idea is you take a surrogate task for which you have a large data set with loads of labeled data, you train a net in order to predict those labels, and even though we don't care about the surrogate task, what we, what we get out of it is internally is a very kind of powerful discriminative and low dimensional representation that we can then use as a feature. So once we've trained our embedding, we go to our target task, which is the one that we actually care about, uh, uh, for which we have a much smaller selection of labeled data. And so now we take the audio data, we pass it through the embedding model, we get out our embedding or features, and we can use th those to train a much smaller model. And what the literature tells us is that this still gives you very high performance, kind of high classification accuracy, even if you have a small amount of uh, label data for this. So I wanted to kind of highlight a couple of kind of star uh, embeddings that have come out over the last couple of years. Um, these are both, they work very well and they are um, open source and released for everybody to use. So hurrah community. Um, SoundNet came out a couple of years ago. Uh, the idea here is that you use video data and you pass the image through a pre-trained vision network and the corresponding sounds from the video through an audio network and the model is optimized to get the audio subnetwork to mimic the output of the vision network. So this does require a pre-trained vision network, which means that at some point there was a large image data set that was labeled. Um, but by doing this kind of transfer learning, you end up with the audio subnetwork and then you can take the output of some of the intermediate layers of the audio network and use that as your embedding. Great. Next, we have VGG-ish. Um, so here, uh, there's just an audio network, but the idea is there's, you know, Google have this giant YouTube 8 million data set that has some labels. So just train this model to predict these labels, use the penultimate layer that is just a 128 dimensional vector and you use that as your embedding. And these two have been used quite widely um, over the last uh, few years. And then comes look, listen and learn. Um, and the cool idea here is that you don't need any labels. The idea is to leverage structure uh, audiovisual correspondence. And I think this is very kind of tightly related to the talks we had at the beginning of the day. So basically the idea is you take a video, you pass the image th through the video subnetwork, the audio through the audio subnetwork, and you just train a model on the binary task of did these come from the same video, yes or no. So all you need is a large collection of videos and you can generate your labels on the fly by basically either taking matching sound and image or sound from one video and image from a different video so they're mismatched. So you don't need any labels, you just need access to a large video data set and you train this and uh, once it's trained you just extract the audio subnetwork and that gives you your audio embedding. So we saw this when the paper came out and we saw, oh this is great, audio set is out now, we have access to a large collection of videos. Uh, unfortunately, L3 embedding uh, wasn't available, so let's just reproduce it. You know, we'll have our own L3 embedding. This will be very helpful for us in the context of Sonic. Um, and so we said, well, if we're already going to retrain an L3 embedding, we might as well experiment with it a little bit and see how, uh, how we can tinker with it and which design choices are important and which design choices are not. Um, and so we asked a few kind of relatively straightforward and simple questions, but uh, interesting nonetheless. For example, does an audio informed input representation give a better embedding? So uh, I think this morning at some point we heard that image people like to work with spectrograms. And I think it's fair to say that environmental sound people like to work with log mel spectrograms. Um, both because, you know, in part perceptually inspired, but more practically, um, if you pitch shift the sound, if you have a linear frequency representation, that pattern will change. On the other hand, if you have a logarithmic or quasi-logarithmic frequency scale, such as a male spectrogram, that pattern will look the same no matter how much you pitch the sound. So if you're then going to input this into a convolutional network with two-dimensional convolutional filters, you want your patterns to look the same no matter where they occur in your male spectrogram. And so just using a quasi-logarithmic representation makes sense. Um, is it important to use matched audio domains between your embedding and your target task? So can we train the embedding on music and then test it on environmental sound classification? Or would that work a lot worse compared to training the embedding on environmental sound and then using it to classify environmental sounds in our target task? So does having matched domains between embedding and target make a difference? Um, 
because we're at a university, it's, it's, uh, we do have some resource constraints, so how much training data is enough, right? You take this embedding, you put it in the oven, how many days or weeks do you need to leave it in the oven before it's ready baked? Uh, we looked at the question of augmentation, but I won't go into that. And then finally, for our downstream classification tasks, how does our uh, MEL-based L3 embedding compare to VGG and SoundNet? Um, so kind of very abridged experimental design. Um, we, uh, step one is to train several variants of the L3 embedding where we're basically experimenting with these different questions that we care about. So varying the input representation and varying the training data, whether it's the amount of training data or the content, right? Whether it matches the, the do audio domain of the downstream task, yes or no. Um, and once we've trained these different embeddings, we then use those as feature extractors uh, to train a simple model, in our case, just a two-layer multi-layer perceptron on some downstream task or target task um, with a small data set of labeled data. And so in our case, we evaluated our different embedding variants on three increasingly small data sets. So Urban Sound 8K, which is 8,000 or so clips, uh, ESC50, which is just 2,000 labeled clips, and DK, uh, the scene classification data set from 2013, which is just 200 clips. So basically, you really are depending on the embedding to carry the discriminative information in order to be able to get high classification uh, results just using a two-layer MLP. And finally, of course, in addition to comparing all of our variants of uh, the look, listen, and learn MEL-based embedding, we also uh, want to compare it against uh, SoundNet and VGG-ish on these tasks just to see how they compare. So starting with the input representation, uh, what we see is that you know, consistently across the three data sets, a MEL-based representation indeed works better than a linear input uh, representation, which is kind of not a big surprise, but it's you know, nice to know and it's nice to have these embeddings. And in particular for the Urban Sound 8K, it was kind of nice that we were able to match the state-of-the-art performance that we'd obtained two years ago, this time with just a very simple two-layer MLP with no bells and whistles just because we're using uh, this embedding as our features as opposed to trying to learn the features directly from the limited amount of training data that this data set has. Um, in terms of matching the content, the audio content, the domain between the embedding and the target, right? So does it matter if, we're, if our target is environmental sound classification, will an embedding trained on environmental videos work better than an embedding trained on music videos, for example? Surprisingly, no. So we were kind of pretty confident going into this that of course matching the domains will result kind of in better performance, but it turns out that that's not the case. Um, you know, we're still trying to figure out what's behind this. One of the theories that we have is that when you're training an embedding based on audiovisual correspondence, what matters most in your training material is the degree of audiovisual correspondence. And so videos of people playing music tend to have a very high degree of audiovisual correspondence, while the environmental videos might have less correspondence between the sound and the video, and maybe that's why it doesn't really matter which of the two we use. And in fact, in some cases, using the music videos to train the embedding actually works a little bit better. Um, how long do we need to leave the embedding in the oven before it's baked? Uh, so, you know, this is just kind of a practical question for us, and, you know, somewhere between 25 and 40 million training samples. Uh, so, you know, and at that point, you start getting a bit of a tapering in terms of the improvement of performance on your downstream task. It doesn't completely plateau, so probably if we trained even more, we'd, the performance would still go up a little bit. But at the very minimum, you need these 25 to 40 million samples for this embedding. And then finally, how does our MEL-based embedding compare to VGG and SoundNet on these three target classification data sets, these small data sets? Um, so here are the results with uh, MEL-based L3 on the left, SoundNet uh, in the middle, and VGG on the right, and kind of consistently across the three data sets, we get slightly better performance using the MEL-based L3. So for us, it was like, great, we can, you know, we can use uh, MEL-based L3 in the context of our work, uh, but which embedding should you use in the context of your work? Well, try it out and figure out for yourself. Uh, so we are going to share all of these uh, pre-trained embeddings. Uh, they, are, they are not in the repo just yet. So if you go there now, it's going to be an empty repo, but hopefully within a couple of weeks, all of these different variants of the look, listen, and learn mail-based embedding will be there, and you can try them out. All right, so last question of the day. <laughs> 
how do we make our models robust to different sensor locations, right? So we have maybe training data coming from a bunch of sensors, but now we want to deploy a sensor in a completely different location. How can we ensure that the model will still perform well in this previously unseen environment? And it's not just about changing location from one sensor to another sensor. Even within the same sensor, the environment can change quite dramatically. Think about like the environment during the day versus the environment during the night. Think about weekdays versus weekends. So even within a single location, we have this constantly cha changing environment and we need to try and make our models as robust and as resilient to these environments as we can. So um, again, big team, collaborations are fun, um, to, uh, to address this. And I'm gonna talk about this in the context of the BirdVox project. Um, but one of the nice things of having two different sensor, uh, acoustic sensor projects is that you can come up with something in one project and then see how well it works in the other project. And sometimes the, the techniques translate and sometimes they don't. Um, so in the context of BirdVox, you know, we collected all of this data and just to illustrate how the environment can change even in a single sensor location, uh, I have this nice uh, video courtesy of Vincent Lostanlin. Um, and the idea is that this is kind of the average or actually it's the median quartiles and centiles of the spectrum over a short period of time in an environment at 6.30 in the evening. So at the top right, we have our clock. Keep your eye on the timer. Uh, and we see that at 6.30 in the evening, we have some insects having a party around two to three kilohertz and four to five kilohertz. Now let's uh, quickly listen to see what this uh, environment sounded like at 6.30 p.m. All right, now let's fast forward time and see how this environment changes. So we see that the two to three kilohertz insects decided to go home to bed, but the four kilohertz insects are still partying hard. Um, and so, but this is a, represents a pretty dramatic change in the environment. And now if we fast forward further, sorry, that's what this sounds like, sort of. Okay, uh, <laughs> let's fast forward that all the way up to the morning, 4.35 a.m. And suddenly we see this kind of big bump in the low frequency uh, audio sample coming. So I hope we, we hear this one. And this is uh, traffic noise. So now we're starting to get some anthropogenic sounds coming in. And so we see that even in a single uh, sensor environment, the, uh, the environment can change quite dramatically, even just over the course of one day. And of course, if we look at kind of these average environments across uh, different sensor locations, we see that they can tend to be very different. So our goal is to, to try and figure out a way to kind of build models that are resilient to all of these changes. And so the first thing we looked at is, is the input representation. Typically, I mentioned uh, in environmental sound, kind of our default are log mel spectrograms. Uh, and so here's a log mel spectrogram for one of our recordings. The, the, the bird vocalizations are these kind of little blips you see at the, at the beginning. But we also clearly see this insect line at four kilohertz, and we see this low frequency rumble coming from the car at around 10 seconds. And so uh, last year, um, again, a uh, team at Google proposed the um, PCN, uh, per channel energy normalization, instead of the log. So instead of applying just your fixed log function to your MEL spectrogram, you apply PCN. And this uh, basically gives you both adaptive gain control and some compression. And so uh, we figured this looks like a very interesting option for our scenario. This was originally proposed for keyword spotting, so like your Google Home Assistant can hear you in your noisy house. For us, what we're trying to uh, spot are these bird vocalizations in a noisy environment. Um, and so we ran this uh, study where we basically both empirically and uh, theoretically looked at why PSEN can be helpful for our scenario. Uh, and we found a bunch of interesting things. It Gaussianizes your input features. It decorrelates your frequency bands. We have some uh, theoretical analysis to help guide you in terms of what values to choose for every parameter in the PSEN front end. Um, 
So if you're interested in that or you want to try PSEN and you need some you know, help in figuring out, well, what parameter values should I use for my specific problem, hopefully this kind of serves as a guide to walk you through that. Um, practically, at the top we have our log mel spectrogram and at the bottom we have our PSEN mel spectrogram. And so we see that the insect line around four kilohertz is completely gone, so is the car. These features have kind of been Gaussianized, so now our, um, our 2D convolutional filters won't be especially activated when they see the car or the insects. And so this kind of is a first step towards making our input features more robust to this change in the environment. But beyond that, we said, okay, we have the features, but these can still ultimately have kind of differences in them. Can we make the model itself robust to some changes in the environment? Can we bake that directly into the model? So let's say that we start with the convnet um, that kind of takes our, uh, our input. Um, can we model the background somehow, somehow have a representation of the background, feed that into an auxiliary network, and have the auxiliary network uh, influence the predictions made by the primary network, such that basically um, no, the, the auxiliary network learns what the, back the background is and helps the primary network factor that out so that it doesn't cause additional confusions. So um, in order to represent the background, we went just for a very simple approach. Again, we're just using these summary statistics. So for example, we take median, quartile, centiles, et cetera, um, over a half an hour period. So because we're doing this averaging over, or median over half an hour, uh, you'd expect that very sporadic things like the bird calls that we care about are not going to be represented here. However, a more stationary and stable noise like the insect noise is going to be in here. So, th so these are our features to represent the background. The question is, okay, now how do we incorporate, so we pass this into a network, and then the output of the network somehow needs to be incorporated into the main network. So the question is, how do we combine those two? So, uh, you know, in our, in, our, in our fixed network, where there isn't any auxiliary uh, input, our final classification layer, you know, we have a, a sigmoid on top of a, you know, our, our learned weight uh, vectors W, um, dot product with X uh, is just, con X is not the input here, it's the output of the penultimate layer of the model. And so W by X, add a bias B. So this is kind of our standard formulation, our final classification layer. One thing we can do is instead of learn W during training and then keep it fixed, we can actually make W be the output of the auxiliary network. The problem is that W is relatively high dimensional and this formulation just doesn't converge when we try to train it. So to, allevi to alleviate this, instead what we can do is we can kind of learn W, keep it fixed, but then segment W into a small number of groups and have the auxiliary network output a factor alpha by which we kind of multiply each one of these groups. So now instead of learning the entire dimensionality of W, we just need to learn a small number of multiplication factors. So we're kind of combining a mixture of experts. And then the final approach is conceptually even simpler, which is we just make the bias term be the output of the auxiliary network. And so you can think about this as a form of adaptive threshold that depends on the characteristics of the background environment. And uh, in our experiments, the latter two are the ones that worked best, and in particular, we decided to go with the adaptive threshold, which both worked well and is conceptually kind of simple and easy to understand. So to evaluate how uh, this and also PSEN kind of helps or doesn't help with our generalization problem, we evaluated different variants of the uh, different combinations of these ideas in a leave one sensor out cross-validation form. So we basically, we train on all the sensors, but we, keep one sensor entirely for test. And so basically the, this kind of shows us whether the network was able to generalize to this new sensor location that it, it had never seen before. Uh, so looking at the results, we kind of, you know, we started with just uh, our CNN, adding augmenta a bit of data augmentation helps, adding PSEN on top of that helps, and adding the context adaptive auxiliary network helps us even more. And so basically what this shows us is that by adding this representation of the background, we are able to train a model that's more robust to changes in the environment where we want to deploy said model. All right, so to wrap up, um, how do we label the data? Well, with crowdsourcing, and we can use the audio annotator, or if we need to generate very carefully controlled stimuli, annotated stimuli, we can use uh, Scaper. 
how do we leverage the labeled, how do we best leverage the label data? Well, now we know that we don't need strong labels, we can just collect weak labels uh, and use those in uh, combined with the multiple instance learning paradigm and our auto pool layer, which um, is also available and you can incorporate it in your models if, if you wish. Um, how do we, uh, what's the next question? <laughs> how can we leverage uh, unlabeled data using deep audio embeddings and uh, the OpenL3 embeddings will be uh, out there soon? And finally, how do we make our models robust to uh, different sensor locations and even within the same sensor location to the evolution of the environment over time. Um, well, by using the piece and front end, which has been incorporated and in, uh, implemented by Vincent in the latest version of Librosa, so you can just try it out as part of the Librosa audio processing library, and uh, combining that with context adaptive networks gives us an extra bump. Uh, and yeah, that's all I have for you today, thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, questions? I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. Hey, uh, great talk. Uh, my question is about the uh, auto pool thing. Yeah. Um, how do you initialize alpha? Because you can bias it towards like very a max or mean at the beginning of training. So. Right. Uh, in our case, I think we just initialized it at one. So basically, you start at soft max pooling, uh, which still gives you sufficient gradient flow, and then. If the network believes that max-like pooling behaves better, it will push alpha up. If it believes that uh, mean pooling behaves better, it will push alpha down. Interestingly, what we saw is that even if max pooling is what's work best, what works best, auto pool works better than max pooling because initially you get this nice gradient flow. You learn a good kind of a good set of convolutional filters to operate on your input, and only then you push towards max. So even if max works best, auto pool works better. Thanks. Sure. Uh, can you compare and contrast a little bit the auto pool kind of multi instance approach um, to the uh, kind of salience map stuff that Jan Schluter was doing um, that in Edithmir two years ago? If you saw that, uh, I did see it, but I, I you know I don't have the details sufficiently okay. kind of in my mind right now to do to to kind of speak to that authoritatively. What I can say, I don't know if this answers your question, but oftentimes uh, people ask how does this relate to attention based uh, mechanisms um, and uh, kind of classic attention is not applicable here because that's designed for structured prediction and this is not a structured prediction problem, right? You're just trying to output uh, tags. There's feed forward attention, which is a little closer to what we'd need. The problem is that even in feed forward attention, the final output goes through a nonlinear function to generate the bag level predictions. And so you, you can't make any assumptions that that nonlinearity will work well on the individual instance level predictions. Recently, out of the, the lab in Surrey, they have a version of feed-forward attention that uses an identity mapping for the final kind of transformation, and that does seem to work uh, fairly well, and so I think, if anything, I'd be curious to compare this to that approach. We haven't done that yet, but that's a very good point. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks. All right, I think uh, that's it. So. Uh,